Okay, I'm just going to test this. So can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes, good. So hello, everyone. Um, welcome my friends, colleagues, and also my students and um, new faces in this room. So my talk today is about Cai Mingliang and the significance of his transition from a filmmaker to an installation artist. I will explore the way French cinephilia impacted his film styles and help to situate him in the global art market. This talk is also about the implication of his shift in practice. It is not simply about introducing cinema into the gallery. Rather, it is a process of thinking about how an alternative exhibition space can challenge our habitual viewing of cinema. So I'm going to start this talk by um, giving you this quote from a culture critic, Susan Sontag. And exactly 19 years ago, in writing about the death of cinema or the decay, decay of cinema, she published this article on the New York Times, in which she wrote, if cinephilia is dead, then movies are dead too. If cinema can be resurrected, it will only be through the birth of a new kind of cinema love. This quote really highlights the entire sentiment of my project, um, of today's talk. And I also think if Susan Sontag is writing as a response to <coughs> the death of cinema, then what Tammy Down is doing in his films and installation exhibitions is also his way of responding to the death of cinema. Uh, so I'm just going to start by um, showing you a couple of the films that he have shot before. He has made 12 feature films so far. Um, a lot of films have been nominated and have won numerous awards at festivals worldwide, especially at European festivals, Cannes, Venice, and Berlin. For example, you have Villa Moore that won the Golden Lion at Venice Film Festival in 1994. You have um, The Hole that won a war in Cannes. And um, his latest film, Straight Dogs, has been nominated for Golden Lion and is the winner of Grand Jury Prize at the 70th Venice Film Festival. So simply listing the films of Timing Down is inadequate to the task of accounting for the significance of his work. The Malaysia-born, Taiwan-based filmmaker has a distinct style that has garnered both cinematic and curatorial acclaim. As one of the Taiwan New Wave directors, his films <coughs> highlight the cinematic echoing and intertextual citation of European New Wave, particularly of François Truffaut. As a cinephile himself, he also stated that time and again, <coughs> he, has, he shows his love for, he grew up watching Truffaut's films and he has this fascination with his films. <coughs> but the connection between French cinema and Taiwan uh, and Thai's work can be traced back to what time is it there, um, where you can see that this film not only has intertextual citation with Truffaut's Le Gaston Coupe um, in this scene, where you can see the Kangshan, a African player, African actor in all of his films, is seen falling asleep while in front of a television where the TV is playing Truffaut's film. And <clears throat> the French New Wave figure, um, Jean Pierre Liot, who appeared in Le Gaston Coupe also made a cameo appearance at the end of what the film, What Time Is It There? And at the festival scene, What Time Is It There was nominated for Bondor at Cannes Film Festival 
and went on to win 12 additional awards at festivals worldwide. Following the success, Thai's sequential films were seen as the exploration of pure cinematic form, a departure from his earlier focus on social critique. And such is the hallmark status of Visage. This film has all star cast featuring many of um, these familiar faces from European New Wave cinema. And this film is um, commissioned by Le Louvre to be the first film collection for the museum. This film certainly epitomized the highest form of recognition Thai received in France. Visage is Thai Minel's ninth feature film. The Louvre's invitation first came in 2005 when Thai attended a Truffaut retrospective event in France. By the next day, the Louvre invited Thai to create a film as part of the museum's collection and as a centennial salute to the history of cinema. When a curator asked Thai, what are you planning to film? His response was rather vague. He said, I wanted the film to feature Jean-Pierre Lyot and Li Kangshen, and they will meet on the museum's grounds. Tai has never shied away from his obsession with Li as his muse and his admiration for Travolta's films. Having Lyot in his picture for the second time also puts a capstone in his career. For the director, Visage not only plays a tribute to Truffaut, but also resource, restores the time gap between Truffaut's death and age Lyot. Tai didn't choose him because he expect him to be a box office magnet. He chose Lyot because he is eager to show the aging side of French New Wave in his highly reflexive and referential film. But Visage is not Taiminel's first film to be situated in a museum. His first crossover to art installation came around 2007, when the Cannes Film Festival wanted to commemorate its 60th anniversary. Jill Jacob, the festival president, commissioned a group of 33 well-known international directors to each make a three-minute film about their experiences with the movie theater. Each took the interpretation of the assignment very differently, but most reflect the condition of viewing. Many include a film within a film or question the depth of cinema. While Thai evokes the filmmaker's own fascination and fetishization of the movie theater. This film is called It's a Dream, and it was shot in an abandoned theater in Kuala Lumpur. The film draws on Thai's own childhood memories with the movie theater. In the 22-minute short, Li Kangshan plays the role of Thai's deceased father, <coughs> Thai's mother, plays herself doing nothing other than eating durang and watching a film. Uh, if you can see it, Thai is actually on the right hand side of the, the picture. I'm um, sorry, the constant. Shortly after It's a Dream premiered in Cannes, the film traveled to Italy's Venice Banal, where Thai participated in a group exhibition organized by Taipei Fine, Art, Fine Arts Museum of Taiwan. In this exhibition, Tai removed the seats from the abandoned theater and shipped them to Venice. His purpose was for audiences to create their own unique moving going experience in the pavilion. It's a dream also mobilized Tai's status as both a filmmaker and an artist. Later, as the entire set was acquired by Taipei Fine Arts Museum as the first film to be part of its permanent collection. Tsai said in an interview with the Taipei Times, 
It's the first time that I sold a video installation to a museum. And this is the first time for a Taiwanese museum to buy a film as part of its collection. The Louvre was the first in the world to collect film. But gradually, my movies find a home, and that is the museum. The same commitment to space that inspires Thai's films also propels its work in the video sector. In 2011, Thai turned the former factory into an exhibition space, <clears throat> titled The Theater and the Boiler Room. In this exhibition, you see a lot of television stacked together in a dark room under the old chimney. It shows old footages of um, abandoned stained mattress. And then on the surrounding walls, you have projectors projecting footages of an empty, abandoned tunnel. Occasionally, Thai's regular cast members would appear in the video projections. As for audiences, you would sit in the discarded auditorium chairs that were originally from Taipei City Hall to watch those videos. There is always an agenda behind Thai's works, whether they are cinematic or video. They're always about a conscious act of rebellion against the way cinema is perceived in today's society. But the question remains, what are some of the implications of this shift in practice? How does such cinematic migration agitate against the anxieties concerning the decay or the death of cinema. Part one, cinema in a gallery. Addressing the first question, we wanted to recognize that cinema since the Nickelodeon era has been placed in darkened theater. Occasionally, even for visual artists such as painters, sculptors, and photographers who work outside of the film industry we still insisted to show a film in a standard movie theater. Such is the case like Isa Jenskan, the German-born sculptor who made a short film in 1972 called Two Women in Combat. She insisted that her film should be shown in a standard movie theater, refusing to screen her work in the museum space. So while audiences do not usually expect to have to go to a museum or a gallery to see films, the intersection between the moving image and the gallery space can be traced back to the early 1960s, where artists found 16 millimeter to be a new dynamic medium to work with. One of the most groundbreaking examples is Nam Jun Pak's Zen for Film. In this work, you see a 60 millimeter film projector runs in front of a blank wall and projects a blank film. So a result, it projects a screen of light. The luminous projections makes a contrast to the whiteness of the museum walls. About 20 minutes in length, the film is completely blank. No visual images appear except for the flickering presence, light scratches on the film strip, and tiny specks of dust made visible in the light cone coming out from the film projector. You see those, those dust that were coming out from the projector and the picture on the left. Zen for film is a film accompanied by only the noise of the projector and the surrounding humdrum of museum activities. What Peck did was a minimalist visual experimentation that highlights what constitutes cinema as an apparatus. The projector, the blank screen, and the viewing space. Among Peck, there were other pioneers who experimented with the moving image in the gallery space, 
such as Andy Warhol, Jonas Mikas, Valley Export, Martha Rosser, Stan Douglas, PAQ, and a lot more. But the work done by these artists were mostly short films. Lengthwise, Alexander Sokurov's Russian Ark is one of the most memorable feature films to be commissioned by a museum. This entire film was in uniquely the longest single uninterrupted long take ever produced in the history of cinema. It's shot on digital camera, but there is absolutely no cuts, no editing to this film. But the director uses a lot of different composition and different camera angles to create an illusion of the editing. As this film was filmed solely within the gates of the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, the paintings, the rooms, and the Winter Palace all became the subject of the director's cinematic treatment. This film, at a total length of 90 minutes, follows a French writer, Marquis de Custin, and travels through time across 300 years of Russian history, presenting the temporal and displacement of the existing. This film is also a transnational production between Russian Art Museum and German Film Company. So if Russian art sets up a pioneering example and illustrates a move to bring filmmaking practices and amusing space into one, the importance of thus approaching Thai cinema in a gallery allows us to look at the implication of such a cinematic migration. And questions, what is the stake here in the fetishization of silhouette within the gallery walls? Additionally, for a film to be commissioned by the Louvre or Cannes also represent film festival's consequential influence on film production because of the role they play in helping a film transition from local production to the global art market. <laughs> Bless you. Thai's making of visage is not coincidental nor an occasional exploration with alternative viewing ex its conditions. Instead, Visage should be viewed as a continual exploration of the many themes from Thai's bodies of work, which demands a reassessment of previous simplified understandings of his short films and installations as gallery art. They are expanded cinema that sits at the intersection between the moving image and an alternative viewing experience. And between the global and regional film cultures taking place at this theater within a gallery site. <clears throat> Part two, the French connection. As aforementioned, European modern cinema shaped in varying degrees of Thai's filmmaking. Likewise, Taiminel's auteur status benefits from a long cultivation of cinephile culture. According to Song Hui Lim, by being associated with both French New Wave and Taiwan New Wave, Tai was integrated into the vocabulary of critics and scholars who measured and marked him with other new wave directors alike. For example, you have Oliver Nicholas, who was probably the first to compare Tsai to Truffaut after viewing Tsai's very first film, Rebels of the Neon God, in which he commented, the connection to Tsai is like who Jean-Pierre Lior is to Francois Truffaut. Gimo Melouchi in L'Express also referred to Thai's pessimistic approach and rich metaphors of homosexuality rendered in long sequences and long takes as resembling the Italian neorealism director Michelangelo Antonioli. Some compared the performances. 
In describing the last scene in Viva L'Amour, Serge Kaganski wrote, at the end of the film, when the girl can no longer refrain from sobbing, reminds me of Jane Mahou in La Nuit. Other honorable mentions include Jean-Luc Godard, Ingmar Bergman, Buster Keaton, and even the Marx Brothers. French critics also like to discuss some of the recurring themes in philosophical concerns in Tice's films, such as the Delusion La Touche, Death, Nostalgia, Loneliness, Emptiness, Sleep, Meditation, and Silence. The most frequent and immediate response to Tai's very, very long take is that it works as a stand-in for the director's look at the decay of cinema. It is dark, ghostly, and dreadful. But because of the outreach of festivals and the att attention to aesthetics and motifs that are articulated and circulated by curators, film reviewers, journalists, and scholars, these critical discussions enable Thai's film to reach a wider international audience. Back in Taiwan, however, Thai's films were perceived as box office poison. His films have been singled out in criticism for the exact same things that French critics loved. These are, again, long takes, static camera, and minimal dialogue. But what changed the local perception was actually when his films began getting recognition at international film festivals. Domestic film critics, festival goers, and cinemists often find themselves compelled to evoke the names of European authors in order to validate Thai's cinema. The same people, the same crew again, Truffaut, Godard, René's, and Tony Oli. Tsai Min is one of the many Taiwanese filmmakers who attend international recognition in recent years. But still, the recognition he received via the International Film Festival circuit surpasses that of his cohorts, referring to Edward Young, Ho Xiaoxian. It is hard to imagine how Tsai would have attained this iconic status without entering the International Film Festival circuit and receiving subsequent endorsements through awards, critical acclaim, and various forms of media exposure. The international visibility of his films ultimately led to the articulation and discussions of various themes and visual styles. His stylistic and thematic traits qualified his status as an auteur instead of a collection of anticipating qualities for his next film. In this respect, film festivals provide films with a set of perceived qualities otherwise unavailable outside those networks of exhibition. The favorable, the favorable festival conditions and French cinephilia thus contributed to the evolving and historically unique conceptions of Tsai Min Yang's films. So part three, which is also the last part. To speak of cinephilia, one cannot forget to mention the darkened theater. As Susan Sontag puts it, people who love cinema, quote, wanted to be kidnapped by the movies. And to be kidnapped, you have to be in a movie theater, sitting in the dark among anonymous strangers, end quote. So for a cinephile like Tai, it is no surprise that recurring theme of his films is the movie theater. And as example here, what time is it there? You have Lee Kang Shen, who plays a street vendor selling watches, and he meets a girl who tells him that she's going to Paris. So from that moment on, his character, bizarrely throughout the film, 
began to reset every clock that he sees into Paris time. <clears throat> so in this particular scene, Li Kangshan wanders into an old movie theater, steals a clock from the corridor, and sneaks into the auditorium where he attempts to reset the clock. But then his scheme is sabotaged by a jumpy man who follows him into the man uh, who follows him into the theater and snatches the clock away from him. So when the Kangshan <coughs> chases after him to the man's back room, he finds this strange man standing half naked in an open stall. If you can see um, in an, an image to the left, with the stolen oversized clock covering his crotch area. In the film, you will actually see that the clock hands actually uh, moves and flickers a little bit as if symbolizing this man's erection. So what I would call this querying of time is also Thai's humorous way to reflect an anxiety about the modernity gap between East and West, in this case, between Paris and Taipei. The intersection of time and the movie theater is further explored in his next film, Goodbye, Dragon Inn. This film consists of many long takes of corridors, dark rooms, and bathroom stalls in the later demolished Fuha Grand Theater, which is the same movie theater seen in the film that I've just shown. The opening scenes of Goodbye, Dragon Inn, like the title, literally pays homage to a classic Chinese wuxia film, King Hu's Dragon Inn. Alternating between the screen and the audience, the projection of King Hu's film runs through the full length of Goodbye, Dragon Inn. I certainly apologize for the quality of the image. Um, originally, an image will show this woman who opens up the door. You see um, a very large theater movie screen showing um, King Hu's Dragon Inn. And an image to the right, um, you can actually see in the movie, Tai Minang's head. So he was sitting actually among the audiences watching the film, in the film. So he met a King Mil Singh in his own film. <clears throat> so this film, intersecting martial arts films in, the, in um, Goodbye Dragon Inn, this film is really saying goodbye to the golden age of Taiwanese cinema. However, the mere citation of King Hu's film is not enough to unravel the complexity in cinematic expressions. This film is also about the layering of screen times in history between the golden age of Chinese cinema that's made in 1967 and between the time, the cinematic time in the film, 2003, when the film was shot. <clears throat> The slurring of screen time and history also goes beyond the dislocation of the characters, but deals with the intersection of different time periods and a historical theater that no longer exists in the present time. If the reflexive mirroring of <coughs> one film in another conveys an awareness <coughs> of the slipping away of time, Goodbye Dragon Inn can be seen as emblematic of Thai's nostalgia for film. Indeed, with the entirety of the story of Goodbye Dragon Inn playing out in a decrypted movie theater, the film is not only echoing the movie screen within, but in a larger sense, storing the memory of, storing the haunted memory of Fu He Grand Theater on screen. Because after Tsai Myung shot the film, um, the theater was not entirely distorted, but um, abandoned. So the picture to your left um, is the scene from the movie. The picture to your right is the actual theater, what it looks like right now. If the like, example of Goodbye Dragon Inn highlights both the conditions of film projection and the film itself, 
the then the reuse of movie theater chairs in the new space demonstrates the traces and extensions of haunted cinema. This is exactly what he did in It's a Dream. The view and experience of It's a Dream is a complex one. The peculiarity of this installation is not just about the memory of cinema, but also about the seats in habit, about the space the seats in habit. The chairs are placed diagonally with no rows of chairs lined up parallel to the screen or to others. They are intentionally set up to intersect with each other, disrupting the customary sense of viewing. As the director declaimed, the audience is, is in his work when you sit on the seats watching his film. When this film is placed in a white gallery space rather than the black movie theater, the viewing experience has been transformed from the darkness of the theater to art appreciation in a white cube. Notably, when watching a movie in a theater, one is less compelled to move about or leave in the middle of the screening, contrary to the flexibility the spectator would have in an art gallery because it is situated in a seemingly open space. In addition, the constant looping of the film screening removes the exclusive regulated relationship a theater film screening would have with time and space. Art patrons enjoy this non-exclusiveness of the screening in that one could enter, leave, and re-enter the viewing at one's convenience. In this respect, while Goodbye Dragon Inn proclaims the death of cinema, this installation of the theater seats announced the resurrection of cinema. As Andrew Yurovsky notes, in thinking about the post-war emergence of cinema in a gallery space, quote, it is not a question of simply introducing cinema into the gallery situation. Rather, it was a process of thinking how the temporality and connectedism of the moving image might be divorced from its habitual situation within the commercial theatrical projection." End quote. This is not to say that all work placed in a gallery space is not theatrical, or that any work placed in a movie theater should not be considered as art. The point here is the emergence of a new institutional situation for the moving image, one that is divorced from the habitual viewing of cinema. So in a similar fashion, Visage is not about leaving the movie theater to create a new kind of movie-going experience. My focus here is not to analyze the film itself, but the exhibition condition it occupies. Having been unable to experiment, experience the premiere at the Louvre, I can only speak about the experience in Taiwan. But let us first return to Roland Barthes' meditation on leaving the movie theater. Barthes argues that the captivating story on the screen is produced by the mechanism and architecture of cinema. A successful cinematic event is one in which the spectator is perpetually fixed. The cinephile's gaze is glued to the screen. Barthes describes this situation as a pre-hypnotic and prefigured by the darkness of the theater. Not only is the dark the very substance of reverie, it is also the color of a diffused eroticism. It is in this dark, urban dark, that a body's freedom is generated. Most importantly, it is not just the naturalness of darkness, but where our bodies are at. Another quote from Barthes, where he says, whenever I hear the word cinema, I can't help thinking hall rather than film. Barthes asks us to accept the hypnotic effects of cinema 
largely because of the darkness of the theater and of the cinematic experience, making possible bliss of discretion. The fascination of the cinema requires us to divorce our <coughs> minds from our bodies in which the spectator is both conscious of and unconscious of the dream state when enters, facilitated by the darkness of the theater. But what happens when modernist filmmakers attempt to disorient the spectators? When the film premiered in Taiwan, the screening took place unusually at the National Theater Concert Hall in Taipei. This film is the most prestigious venue in the capital of Taiwan to host a world-class musical, dance, and theater performances. But never in its history had it shown cinema. So as Tai stood on the stage, gleefully introduced Visage to premiere at the concert hall in 2009, he said, this is not the most <coughs> appropriate site to show movies. He continued to remark apologetically to the audience that they might notice a few scratchy noises caused by the running film reel, or even worse, when sound failed to synchronize during projection. This was because the projector was not set up in a separate room. His concerns might be too trivial for anyone growing up watching films with a running projector as opposed to digital projection. But it is precisely the working of a darker theater that makes most audiences forget their surroundings when watching a movie. Audiences are typically stitched into the diegetic world by a chain of cinematic techniques. And these registers do not require explorations of events happening outside of the frame. So when a director like Tai urges audiences not to pay attention to what's happening outside of the frame in an actual space, he inadvertently highlighted his audience's senses to look out for any extra diegetic incidents or technical mistakes. Just like it's a dream, and turn this ordinary viewing experience into an ordinary one. While well, the Louvre has entered into the cinematic space, the spectators are actively making use of the real concert hall space. This act is a resurrection of cinema because of the love for cinema. Tai also once said, it sounds like a contradiction, but movies need to leave today's theaters in order to be resurrected. In the long run, Tai was attempting to enter into dialogue with the gallery space and the possibilities of alternative exhibition. The interrelations between Tai's film installations and feature films show that they originate from and are still part of his love for cinema. In, in what time is it there? The movie theater is only part of the larger intersecting dislocation of time and space between Paris and Taipei. And this temporal relationship of simultaneity is extended with Goodbye Dragon Inn as it returns to an abolished movie theater. It's a dream also displaces patrons and spectators, spectators alike in between the darkened theater and the white gallery space. Well, the movie theater is in some way preserved in Thai's previous films. Visage is a spatial practice that marks the transition from movie theaters to a new exhibition site. A move, I believe, gives birth to a new kind of cinema and a new kind of cine love. Thank you.